Hi, Caleb Aylesworth here for CG Tuts, and you're watching 3ds Max 2010 Graphite Modeling Tools Function and Practical Application. This is part one of the tutorial, Using the Tools. The software that we'll be using is 3ds Max 2010, and our focus will be on an overview of the Graphite and Freeform modeling tools, and also how to use each one of their functions. Okay, so here we are in 3D Studio Max, and um, the first thing that I'm going to want to do is open up my graphite modeling tools. I have them already open here, but uh, if you don't have them open, then all you're going to want to do is go up to your tools menu here and check off graphite modeling tools down at the bottom. Once you have them open, it may look like this. Uh, this is just where the panel is completely collapsed. So what I usually like to do is I like to open it right up so I can show the full ribbon. You can see the little hot box there. It says show full ribbon. So I'm just going to click on this arrow and that's going to open up this ribbon across the top here which is uh, the ribbon for all of the graphite modeling tools. So first thing is there's this little icon right here. It says toggle command panel. Uh, that's basically the normal panel that we're all used to with all of our modifiers and our various different tools and options off to the right here. So at any time we can just click this button in the graphite modeling tools and we can toggle that on and off. So I'm going to keep it on for now. Uh, later on though I'm probably going to hide it all together so we can just focus on the graphite modeling tools. So that being said, um, for the purposes of this tutorial what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the majority of the graphite modeling tools in Max 2010 that I find to be very useful on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, there's a lot of tools here, especially you can see we've got three tabs here. We've got graphite modeling tools, freeform, and selection. For today, because of the uh, scope of the tutorial, we're mostly going to be looking at graphite modeling tools and a few of the freeform tools. Um, we won't be looking at selection at all because we just don't have time for it. So um, the other thing that I think I should mention before we get started is that a lot of the tools in this graphite panel are repeats of some of the tools that we can find over here, some of the various different buttons and options, um, especially when it comes to the selection buttons and uh, sub-object selection and a few of the various different operations and functions. A lot of them are repeats of uh, things that we can find over here in uh, our right-hand panel. So if we come across those, I'll mention them. I'll quickly maybe demo how they're used uh, just so you can see which ones they're a repeat of. But I won't go into too much detail about uh, how to use them because they've already existed in this software for many versions in the past. Um, the ones I'm really going to be spending some time on are going to be the ones that are brand new and uh, ones that I find will be very useful and the big time savers on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, without talking too long here, why don't we just get started? So first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw a cylinder down here in the middle of my file, uh, in the middle of my world space, sorry. And uh, for the purposes of this tutorial, most of the time I'm just going to be working on this cylinder. Showing you how to use some of these various different functions in the graphite modeling tools. Okay, so there we go. Got a nice cylinder. So the first thing that you need to do, you'll notice that there's no tools uh, at all in this ribbon. It looks very empty. That's because I don't have any editable polys selected. In order to use the graphite modeling tools, your object has to be an editable poly. So there's a couple ways we can change an object into an editable poly. Sorry. Um, right now, this is still a primitive object, and I can still edit its properties here. So one of the ways is to right-click and go Convert to Editable Poly. That's the uh, old-fashioned way. But built right into the Graphite modeling tools, you have two options here. You have Convert to Poly, which will automatically convert your object to an editable poly. And if I undo that, you also have Apply Edit Poly Mod, which applies an editable poly modifier, which can also be found up here under your modifiers list, but it takes a lot longer. Most of the time for me, I prefer to just go right ahead and convert it to a poly 
instead of applying a modifier. Now, also under this panel, we have a couple of other things here. We have generate topology and symmetry tools. I'm not going to show you generate topology. I find it to be really gimmicky. All it does is uh, generate some various different sort of polygonal patterns across the surface of your object. They're presets, and uh, I don't find them to be very useful at all. The other one is symmetry tools, which could be very useful. Uh, these tools, what they do is they allow you to create symmetrical objects when using a standard symmetry modifier is not an option. Um, one of these situations might be for doing blend shapes with characters, but again, that's uh, sort of out of the scope of this tutorial, so I won't really be demoing those tools today. Um, next up, what we have here is we have our selection options. We have vertex selection, edge selection, border selection, polygon selection, and element selection. These are identical to the old-fashioned selection options in the right-hand panel over here. So uh, I won't go into those into too much detail. Um, the next thing that we have here along the list is if we go into one of these selection modes, we have these other buttons under here. Now this is a, a preview option. This is something that I have seen in Maya, but I don't believe was previously in Max at all. All it does is it allows you to preview your selection before you select it. You can see this little yellow uh, cursor moving around on top of the model. And then when I finally click on it, I actually make my selection. I don't really find that very useful because if I'm planning to select something, then I would just go ahead and select it. I wouldn't really try to preview my selection um, before I select it. But the options are here. You can preview a sub-object. Sub you can preview a multi-sub-object. So you can uh, preview multiple selections at the same time. And this one is kind of useful. We have ignore back facing, which uh, if you want to make a marquee selection or something like that, say I want to select these vertices here. Normally, if I were to do that, I would select the vertices on the back of the object too. But if I toggle ignore back facing on, then when I select these, I shouldn't have any selection at the back. Basically what it does is any of the sub-object or sub-elements on the opposite side of your model that are eclipsed by the silhouette of the model will not be selected. So that allows you to marquee select various elements on the front of your object without selecting their counterparts on the back of the object. That's a very useful button. Uh, once again, it did exist over here and as you can see it's checked off but we just have a quick hot button for it up here on our shelf. And we also have a quick hot button for soft selection, which I like as well. Um, soft selection basically just allows you to select surrounding sub-elements of whatever selection that you have. So if you select a face, then it will actually move um, the other sub-elements, the other faces around it or adjacent to it with a varying degree of falloff. And Normally, the soft selection options are over here in your panel on the right-hand side. And this is the area where you can go ahead and adjust the level of falloff and the other various details. But once again, since that existed in the past, I won't show it too much for this, uh, this tutorial. So next up, what we have is the toggle command panel, which I showed you already. Then we have this little useful button. This button, I think, is pretty neat. It's called Pin Stack. Now, what that will allow you to do is it will allow you to save your place within your modifier stack if you deselect your object and go over to edit another object. Um, I find this very useful when I'm doing sub-D modeling because normally, if you were to apply, say, a TurboSmooth modifier onto your object, and then you were to select away from it and try to select another object, what would happen is you would end up losing the, uh, the view or the effect of the low poly version of the object. But where that can cause problems is, say I had, I had my sub D cylinder here, and then what I wanted to do was I wanted to model another object uh, an extension of that, but eventually I wanted to weld it in to the low poly version. 
and uh, match it up so that I could weld the vertices in and have it as an extension of this version of the object. If I wanted to do that in the past, as soon as I go away to work on my other piece of the object and tweak the verts and move them around and stuff, what I'm going to see is I'm going to see the result of the sub D version of my cylinder here. And that makes it very difficult to match this low poly version up to the low poly version of my sub D cylinder. So then what I can do here with this pin stack is I can go down to edit poly within my stack away from the turbo smooth modifier and I can hit pin stack and now if I go over and I select this object, voila, you don't see the result of the turbo smooth modifier. All you see is my low poly version of my sub D cylinder. So now, easily enough, I can just go ahead and I can convert this box to an editable poly and if I wanted to, pardon me, I need to go and pin my stack again. Then I can easily select elements of this object, this, uh, this box, and position it around or move it around and uh, I won't have to see the end result of my selfie cylinder. Then if I turn it off again and I go back to this object, what you're going to see is the subject cylinder retraining. Now I'm just going to delete that modifier, delete this cube, and move on. So next up we have uh, show end result. Again, this is the exact same as this button over here. It just shows you the end result of all of the modifiers in your modifier stack. Moving along, we have a few UV options. I'm not going to show these today. They're fairly simple. One of them is preserve UVs, which basically just allows you to move or slide ele or sub elements of your object around and preserve the effects of the UV so that you don't end up stretching your UV coordinates when you move it. The other one is quite the opposite of that. The next one is tweak, which basically will allow you to scrub over top of your model and actually move the UV coordinates around in your 3D viewport rather than having to do it within your unwrap edit window. Oh, Next up, I really like this one. This is the repeat button. This is something that they've had in Maya for a while. Um, you simply hit the G key and it will repeat your last operation or the last function that you performed. Now we finally have it in Max. It's a pretty useful tool. So basically any operation that I try to do, say I were to do an extrude on the top of the cylinder here, and I want every extrude that I do after that to be the exact same height and the same parameters, I can simply just keep hitting my repeat key and it will keep repeating the exact operation that I did last time. So that's a very handy, very quick, very useful tool and I love it. Next up we have use NERMS. NERMS is a subdivision type of operation. It's basically the same type of function that they use in the mesh smooth and turbo smooth functions. So you can toggle this button, uh, sorry wrong button, you can toggle this button on and off to smooth your model out. Now the uh, parameters for that, I'm not sure why, but they throw them all the way over here in the right hand corner. You can see we have iterations, smoothness, and we have a few buttons here. One of these buttons is the cage button. I hate the cage, so I always turn it off. It's this weird orange thing around our subdivision model that shows what the low poly version of the model looks like without the subdivisions on. Uh, I don't like it. It gets in my way, so I always just turn it off. I like to see what I'm working with when I'm doing sub D without having too much stuff in my way. This other button here is Isoline Display. So what that does is that shows you a simplified version of your subdivision surface. It will show you single lines instead of all of the actual quads or subdivisions that are being created with your number of iterations. So as you can see here, I'm, I'm just turning up the iterations with 
each iteration, it will subdivide each quad in my model into four quads. So there we go. One more time. I usually like to work when I'm doing sub D with two iterations. Um, smoothness, I don't use very much, but it basically allows you to have some form of uh, a degree of fall off with your smoothness. So you can do like a 0.3 or a 0.4 and it will attempt to do a, a certain level or a certain degree of smoothness in between 0 and 1. I don't really find it very useful. Um, I just use my iterations and my loops and subdivisions on my surface to control the amount of smoothness. I find that I have much more control that way. Um, now there's this other flyout uh, drop down menu here and there's a few things that are worth mentioning on this uh, drop down menu as well. We have smooth result. Um, basically what that'll do is if you don't have it checked off then it won't smooth the result of your subdivision. So if you have um, different smoothing groups on the sides and top and then you and then you hit uh, smooth result or check it off, then it won't smooth your result for you. But if you do have it checked off, then it will go ahead and smooth your final result. There you go. That's the effect I was looking for. You can see how the top of the cylinder, although it has been subdivided, it actually has preserved the different smooth smoothing groups on the top of the cylinder. But if I check off smooth result, it'll apply a single smoothing group to everything and give you that final smooth result that you want. Next below smooth result we have separate by. Now I find this to be a, a very useful tool because what you can do is you can actually separate your subdivision by smoothing groups. So if I apply various different smoothing groups to different parts of the model it will subdivide everything um, and average the angles that are within the same smoothing group. So right now you can see with my subdivision, because the sides of my cylinder were in the same smoothing group, I have a very nice smooth side to my cylinder. But the top and bottom of the cylinder were different smoothing groups. So when I check off separate by smoothing groups, then it will not average the corners out. It won't round them out um, or average the angles between them. Likewise, if you say separate by material ID, it will be the exact same thing. So you can apply different material IDs to different polygons and then it will not average between those polygons that are separated by material IDs. Um, next up on the options here, we have render. Uh, you can choose to render in a couple different ways with your smoothness. You can choose to render by iterations or render by smoothness. Uh, I would always prove to, or uh, sorry, I would always prefer to render by iterations. Um, because again that gives you way more control. You'll notice that up here I have two iterations but in this box next to the word iterations in this drop down panel I have zero. So this is where you can control it because even if you have two iterations up here you can decide to render with zero iterations and that'll just apply the smoothing groups but without actually uh, subdividing it. Or you can choose one, two, or even more iterations than you've actually subdivided up here. And that will render an even smoother result than your actual viewport results just by toggling this on and off. Uh, smoothness, I'm not sure why you would actually want to do that. Again, that'll just render this sort of fall off thing, but I haven't found it to be very useful yet. Moving on, we have uh, grow selection and shrink selection. That is the exact same as grow and shrink over here. I uh, will just very, very quickly demo its effect. Select a polygon, press grow, will select adjacent polygons to your selection. Shrink will go backwards from that and uh, deselect all the surrounding or outside polygons of your selection. Next up, we have loop selection options. Um, these loop tools can be very useful. So basically, the first one is just loop. It's the exact same as the loop button over on your right hand side. 
but there's another one here that says loop cylinder ends. This one is, is very useful. And um, also, I should mention in the graphite modeling panel, you have this little arrow next to it, which will open up your options. Holding shift and clicking on the main button performs the exact same function as clicking this little arrow to the side of the button. So that's just a faster way to do it. I prefer to do it that way. Now, previously, if we wanted to select a loop around the end of a cylinder that had not been triangulated, uh, in Max default cylinders don't get triangulated, you actually have to go in and manually triangulate the tops of them. Previously, that caused a problem with selecting a loop around the end of a cylinder. So say I wanted to select the loop of this cylinder around the top and chamfer it so I could get a, a bevel on the corner. If I wanted to do that, I couldn't do it by pressing this loop button. I would have to do some hacky method of it by, say, selecting the face and then holding control and going to edge mode. And then that would allow me to select the loop around the cap of the cylinder. Uh, that's sort of a hacky way of doing it. But if I just wanted to go in edge mode, select one edge, and hit loop, like on the side here, I could not do that. So this button here, loop cylinder ends, allows you to do that. So by simply holding shift and clicking on this button, I can now select the entire loop on my cylinder end. And then if I want to chamfer it or something, I can go ahead and do that easily and quickly. Next up, we have Grow Loop and Shrink Loop. Grow Loop is this button with the plus sign on it. What that does is it allows you to sequentially extend your loop. So rather than selecting an entire loop all around the entire object, what you can do is select one edge in a loop and then hit the plus button. And step by step, it will grow your loop. Again, the minus will shrink your loop sequentially from adjacent edges or segments. Then we have loop mode. I like this one because it's very quick. Rather than selecting an edge and then hitting loop and selecting an edge and hitting loop, you can just select an edge with loop mode on and it will select the entire loop. And you can do it with control and select a group or cluster of loops quickly and easily by using loop mode. Next up, we have dot loop. Now, dot loop is a really cool function. Uh, I think there are almost endless uses for this. It's really great when it comes to trying to optimize um, an object. So uh, I really, really love this tool. Basically, what you can do is you can select loops that are not um, continuous. You don't have to select an entire loop. You can select every other segment in a loop. You can select every third segment in a loop. It's totally up to you. And the easiest way to do this, uh, actually the only way, is by using this dot loop button, rather than by manually going in and selecting every other one. So all you have to do is select one edge and hit the dot loop button. And as you can see, right now, it's selected every third edge in this edge loop. Again, you can do that to the entire cylinder if you wanted quite easily. And then you can convert your selection to, say, faces, and then extrude. And as you can see, the opportunities are really endless because in the past, I would have actually had to go in and manually select those before I hit, uh, hit extrude. But now I can just do it with the click of a button. If you want to uh, modify the gap or the number of spaces in between each edge that gets selected, to do that, you just go down here in this drop down menu and it says dot gap. Right now, I have dot gap set to two. If I turn it to one, then it will select every other edge. And if I turn it up to three, then it will select every fourth edge. It'll put three, three edges in the gap before it selects the next one. So as you can see right now, I only have these two edges selected. And every three ones in between have been skipped. Moving on, we have the ring tools. Ring tools are the exact same as 
the loop tools. This is the standard ring option. Then we have the grow ring, which is just like the grow loop. Hit plus and it grows your, your ring selection sequentially. Hit minus and it subtracts your ring selection. Ring mode, turned on, will select entire rings simply by clicking one edge. And dot ring does the exact same thing as dot loop, which is by hitting it using the dot gap settings, it will select only one edge in every certain number around the ring of the object. One extremely useful function for that that I found is to remove geometry when opti optimizing a model. So as you can see, I've gone and turned my dot gap down to one. So now if I hit dot ring, it selects every other edge, and then I can easily just go and hit loop. And now I have every other edge loop selected, just like that. And then if I just want to quickly remove it, bam, I've just cut the number of polygons or sides in my cylinder down to half in an extremely, extremely quick fashion. So very, very useful tools. There's a few other tools in here. Um, I don't find them useful at all. Similar, uh, basically what that does is it selects similar uh, selection types with various different options. So basically, if I hit that similar button with this selected, it will try to select all the polygons that have a similar shape or surface area to this polygon, which is basically all of them because they're the exact same. Outline is the same kind of a thing. You just make a selection and then it will select an outline around that selection. Again, I can't really see too many uses for that, so I think it's just kind of gimmicky. Won't go too far into that one. Um, moving on through our list here, we have Quick Slice. This one's kind of cool. I haven't really found too much of a use for it yet, but basically it allows you to make a really quick cut through your object and that cut will go all the way around the object and it does it based on your viewport so whatever kind of view you're in be it perspective or orthographic um, it will just do a slice through your model perpendicular to your view plane kinda cool um, haven't really used it too much but I think it's kinda neat Cut is the good old cut tool that we're all used to. Point and click and cut topology across your model, or cut edges across your model. Good old standard cut tool. Um, Swift loop, extremely useful. One of my favorite tools. Uh, this tool exists in Maya. I'm glad they brought it into Max now. Basically, as you can see, you drag over the model and it shows you a preview of an edge loop going around your model. Click and it applies the edge loop. Extremely, extremely useful tool for sub D modeling or for just adding a nice topology into your model and keeping a good flow with your edge loops. Um, very useful tool for surface modeling. I can't stress that enough. So uh, I suggest you become comfortable with that. Next tool up is this tool called P-Connect, which is Paint Connect. This is like the single most useful multi-purpose tool for optimizing models or basically in any kind of poly modeling. I've never seen a tool quite like this. It's, a, it's an all-in-one tool, so I'll get right to it. Basically, it's called Paint Connect. Drag across your model while holding the left click and it connects edges together. Just like that. Shift drag and it connects your edges but exactly in the middle of the edges so it finds the, the middle exact middle between the two vertices on the edge and it draws geometry there you can see where this is going it becomes amazingly amazingly efficient because you have you don't have to keep going back and pressing other buttons you just hit a hotkey and it allows you to do different things. So again, left click drag, 
connect edges. Shift left click drag, connect the centers of edges. Control drag, and you can connect vertices together. Pretty cool, huh? Alt and click removes a, ver er, a vertex, sorry. Control alt removes an edge. Control shift removes an entire edge loop. That simple. Control shift, remove edge loop. And shift alt will allow you to draw a set of parallel edges between edges. I know that was probably a lot for you in a very short time. The main thing is that you are aware of this tool that it exists and that you can become comfortable using it. If you forget the hotkeys, not to worry. Just hold on top of the button and it will show you all of them in the list right there for you to see. So just be aware of it. This tool exists. It's really fast and awesome and cool to use. So have fun with it. Next up we have our constraints buttons. The constraints buttons are the exact same as these constraints over here. You have your edge, face, normal constraints to the right. So won't go into those too much. Um, edge constraints basically allows you to select a vertex or a, a sub-object element. Oh, one thing I should mention too, that's why I was having a problem there. You have to click key connect again. That's the only problem with it. When you click it once, it remains active even if you switch to a different menu or, or a different sub-object selection mode. You have to click it again to exit the tool. So that's why I was having some problems there. Uh, anyways, with edge constraints on, basically it constrains the movement of this vertex or the sub-object to the edge that it resides on. And you can also do that with edges. You can constrain edges to edges as well. And as you can see, I can't really move it away from the silhouette of the object. So that's edge constraints. Next is face constraints. Face constraints will constrain the vertex to the face or the polygon that it resides on. So in this case, I can't move it at all because it doesn't slide across any faces. Uh, so it basically just freezes it in place and isolates it. If I had a, a vertex in a face, I could slide it across the face using the face constraints. And then the next is constraint to normal. And that one will allow you to constrain the movement or a translation of an object based on its face normal. Uh, I don't use that one a lot because, you, as you can see, you get some really strange kind of wonky results. It's like trying to scale my polygon when I'm trying to move it. So that's very strange. I don't use it very often. Um, moving along, Relax. Relax is a really cool tool. It is basically the same as the Relax tool in unwrapping or the uh, UVW unwrap modifier window. So basically, you can hit this Relax tool, um, or you can bring up the Relax settings. And what it will do is it will try to average the vertices between their surrounding vertices and just relax the topology out a little bit. So as you can see, it's now trying to move these vertices in towards the back-facing vertices that were selected. If I had ignore back-facing on and I tried to relax these vertices, then it would basically just relax them in towards each other ever so slightly. Just like relaxing your UVs using the relax tool in the unwrap UVW modifier. And then uh, again, you have similar sort of options. You can hold your boundary points. You can just hold the outer points. You can change the amount of iterations or the relax amount. Um, so again, all very interesting and useful tools. Uh, it's good if you sort of mess up your geometry. You kind of walk it out a little bit by accident and you want to try to relax it back to the way it was. So then you can just go and grab your relax tool and it'll start to 
average things out and just relax your model back to a somewhat normal position. After that, we have the attach button and the detach button. Those are the exact same as the attach and detach that we're all used to, where you can uh, attach or detach objects from one another. So I won't try to get into those too much. We have the create button. And this one is really cool. Uh, it's the same as create polygon tool before, where if you had a hole, you could click on a sequence of three or four vertices and create a polygon uh, within that mesh, except they've added a new feature, excuse me, where you can actually create a polygon in your viewport. I don't really try to do it in perspective because it doesn't understand and it creates some really weird stuff, but it's really good for just creating polygonal shapes in orthographic view. You can actually go and create a polygon in floating space, just like that by drawing it in your viewport. And as you can see, it was done in sub-object mode, in polygon mode, so it's actually still part of my cyl cylinder object. It's not a new object with a new name or anything. I've actually just drawn this polygon and created it as a part of this cylinder object. So once again, that tool should come in handy for just uh, drawing various shapes in quickly and then expanding on those. Next up we have our Mesh Smooth and Tessellate. These are just subdivision sort of options. So Mesh Smooth, uh, I don't really use it too much. Again, you can separate it by materials or smoothing groups, and every single time you hit Apply, it subdivides each quad into four more quads. Um, I don't use that one very much because it basically applies it and collapses it down into your your object, so you can't go back and edit it later. I would prefer to just use a Turbo Smooth modifier where you can toggle it on and off uh, the results and delete it later on if you don't like what you got. You can always delete it, remove it, put it back on later. So I prefer a Turbo Smooth modifier or the NURMS, which you can toggle on and off. If you use Mesh Smooth or likewise with Tessellate, it just applies it to your object and collapses it, and that's it. You, you can't really undo it. Now, the difference between tessellate is that tessellate, you can choose to tessellate by edge, which does your standard sort of tessellation and subdivides things into quads, or you can choose to tessellate by face, which seems to tessellate things into these weird triangular formats. Um, I haven't used it very much. I don't know why you would want to use it, because normally when you subdivide your model, you want to subdivide it into quads, not these strange prism snowflake-like effects. So I tend not to use it. You'll also notice that it automatically separates the object based on its smoothing groups, so that it will only tessellate the side geometry, and it will not tessellate it between the, the different smoothing groups as a turbo smooth modifier or nerves would do. The one cool feature it does have, although again I haven't found too much of a use for it, is it has this tension feature, which if you go negative it will tend to pull the geometry that is creating inwards towards the center of the model, and if you give it a positive value it will push that geometry that is creating outwards away from the center of the model. Kind of cool. You can get some neat effects with it, but uh, again, kind of gimmicky. I don't know how functional it really is. Uh, use displacement is a little complex, and we won't talk about that during this tutorial, maybe a later tutorial. Make a planar is sort of cool. Um, it's the same as the make planar button over here in the edit geometry. Uh, oops, I converted that to an editable mesh. I want to make it uh, an editable poly here. So there was a Make Planar button over in the right-hand panel here. Um, it can be useful. I've never really used it too much in a production environment or anything like that. 
But basically, if you have a selection of faces and they're kind of curving or they're getting a little wonky or something and you want to flatten them out into a planar surface, you can just hit that make, make planar button and it will do its best job to flatten them out again. I guess if you're adding a lot of topology and stuff and you find that your geometry is getting a little bit out of control and you want to flatten things out again, you can use that button. I tend to try and add topology as needed um, and adjust the lower levels of the topology before I start subdividing again. So I haven't found too much of a use for that button. Uh, the align tools are similar to the standard align tools up here, so I won't go into those very much. And these tools here are just the smoothing tools. Basically, uh, it just affects how your object smooths. So you can hit the hard one to make every single polygon not smooth with the adjacent polygons. You can hit smooth, and that will smooth everything together. Or you can choose smooth 30, which will smooth to a 30 degree angle. So anything under 30 degrees will smooth with the adjacent polygons. Any angle over 30 degrees will uh, not smooth. And again, they also have little flyout options where you can say smooth selected, hard selected, and smooth 30 selected. And that will only do it to the selected polygons. So that basically concludes the review of those tools under object mode. But we still have a little bit of distance to go here. We have to look at some tools that are specific to edge mode, vertex mode, and polygon mode. So first thing, let's take a look at some tools that are spe specific to the vertex mode. You'll notice that a lot of the tools uh, that exist are the exact same. Uh, the grow selection, and all these various different selection tools, um, the redo button, all of these things are identical. So I won't really discuss those. Um, but there are a couple here that are unique to vertex mode. So I'll try to talk uh, about those a little bit. Um, so this one's kind of cool. Extrude vertex. Basically, you can just select a vertex and it will create uh, an extrusion of that vertex, sort of a pyramid. So basically it chamfers the vertex out and then extrudes it and collapses the extruded surface into a pyramid shape. And you can control the base width of your extrusion too if you like. So you can scale it in or scale it out. Um, not a ton of uses for that, I don't think, but I can see a few applications maybe if you want to make some thorns or spikes coming out of things quickly, or um, just a, a quick way to inset uh, a limb of some sort between your polygons, that would be a quick way to do it. Chamfer is good old chamfer that we all know, so I won't talk about it too much. Basically just turns that vertex into four vertices and creates a polygon in the center. The weld tool is the same weld tool that we're all familiar with. So you can make a selection of vertices and you can turn up the threshold and it will weld all your selected vertices together depending on how high you turn up the threshold. What I like about it is that there's a, a little option underneath the weld threshold that says number of vertices and it shows you a before and after of how many vertices you had before you welded everything and how many afterwards. And it's interactive, so as you turn up the threshold, you can see how many vertices you're losing. Very uh, useful, I think, that extra little option that they added. Remove is the same old remove button that we had before. Break. Break is kind of cool. Um, what break does is it creates a new vertex for each polygon that's touching that vertex. So if you hit the break button, then what you can do is you can actually start to peel the polygons back and they're no longer attached together where that vertex was. They're not welded anymore. It's sort of the opposite of welding the vertices together. You can separate them apart from one another. And then you could possibly you know, add some more geometry in there or weld it together or whatever you want. 
and target weld is the same good old target weld that we're all used to. Just click the vertex, click on the next one, and it will weld them to 